when chemicals come together to form a chemical reaction or when molecules come together to form a chemical reaction, what happens is you have in your reactants bonds break and then in your products new bonds are formed. So breaking of a chemical bond requires energy. Think of it, think of it as like picking up a stick and you need to break it in half. It takes some energy to break that in half. And then to form a new bond, you release energy. And that's because you're making, whenever you're putting the chemicals back together, it's a more stable arrangement to put them together than it is to leave them apart. So as you see in this slide, it says to cleave a bond um, in this particular um, situation between two chlorines. It says 58 kilocalories per mole have to be added to break the bond or to cleave it. And then to form the bond, 58 kilocalories per mole would be released. Now, that number of 58 kilocalories per mole is going to be different depending on the molecule you're looking at. But overall, that's what, um, what we're talking about here is the fact that it takes energy to cleave a bond and release energy to form a bond. We often measure the overall change in energy in a reaction um, with this term delta H. So delta H is also referred to as the heat of reaction or the enthalpy change of a reaction. And we can use some more terminology to describe that. And we can refer to these reactions as either endothermic or exothermic. In an endothermic reaction, energy is going to be absorbed in, meaning that it takes extra energy from the system in order for the reaction to occur, right? Energy has to be taken in. Um, in that case, delta H is going to be positive. Um, when energy is released, the reaction is going to be exothermic. Energy is going to be given off exothermic, and delta H is going to be negative. Um, in other words, we give off energy to the surroundings. So a lot of times that energy would be in the form of heat. Um, so what does this mean whenever we're talking about the relative delta H values? Well, when delta H is negative, it basically means that more energy is released when you form the bonds than when you break the bonds. And the second bullet point here says that the products are lower in energy than the reactants. So what that means, and I have a slide later on that talks about an energy diagram, but I'm going to go ahead and talk about it now, and I'm just going to sketch it here. So we can look at um, a graph. So on the y-axis, it's going to be energy. And then on the x-axis, we'll just call it the reaction time or like the reaction coordinate. In other words, we're going to start, say, um, right here. And that's going to be with our reactants. And then over the course, a reaction occurs. And it usually will go up. And then it's going to come down. All right. And then so over here, we're going to have our reactants. Over here, we're going to have our products. So in this case, if you imagine just kind of random numbers over here, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Let's call those, pretend the energy is in kilocalories. So the reactants are at 3 kilocalories, and the products are at 1 kilocalorie. We would say the products are lower in energy because they're lower on this graph than the reactants. And if we were to measure the delta H, remember that delta anything is going to be final minus initial. Well, I can't spell. Initial. All right, so final minus initial. Well, the final delta H in this case is going to be 1 kilocalories. The initial delta H is going to be 3 kilocalories. 1 minus 3 is going to be negative 2 kilocalories. Delta H would be negative. All right, so that's how this works. And again, if you look at the um, reaction here on the bottom, it says that in this particular um, combustion reaction where you have CH4, which is methane being uh, reacting with oxygen to form CO2 and water, heat is released to the tune of um, negative 213 kilocalories per mole. So 213 kilocalories of energy would be released, and that's typically in the form of heat. All right, so when delta H is positive, um, the products are higher in energy than the reactants, and energy is going to be need to take an into the system. Coming down here, right? I'm going to draw another graph. This time it's going to go like this, right? 
the products over here are going to be higher in energy than the reactant. So one, two, three, four, five. If we said that the delta H is equal to final minus initial, the final is up here. Um, we'll call that at five. The initial we'll call at two. We would say we have three kilocalories, three kcals, right? This is going to be, again, in kilocalories. All right, so again, this case, the products are higher in energy than the reactants over here. Your delta H is going to be positive. So that means if we start with 2, we get to 5, we need to have 3 extra kilocalories of energy coming in, and usually that would be energy from the surroundings. All right, so here's a table that, break down, that breaks down endothermic versus exothermic reactions. Um, this is just reviews all the stuff that we just talked about. Um, so energy diagrams are kind of what I, I just talked about on those previous slides. Um, this uh, slide here kind of summarizes uh, these things. It talks about plotting energy on the vertical axis and the progress of the reaction on the horizontal um, axis. Now, the one thing I want to point out that I didn't specifically mention is that for a reaction to occur, two molecules have to collide with enough kinetic energy to break the bonds. Right? Remember that whenever a reaction occurs, you have to break the bonds and then form new bonds. So molecules are constantly in motion. So for a reaction to occur, those molecules have to collide and hit each other, and they have to collide with enough energy to cause breaking of the bonds. And we'll talk about that a little bit more here in just a second. Um, so in terms of that energy that's necessary to break the bonds, that's what this transition state is. So if you noticed on all the graphs that I drew, we started at our reactants, and then it kind of went up to a peak, and then it goes down. And it can come down lower than where you start, or it could come down higher than where you start. But there's always some kind of peak, and that peak is called the transition state. That transition state is going to be the top level of energy in a reaction. And that's, if you think of like a roller coaster, right? In a roller coaster, there's an initial input of energy to get you to the top of the big hill, which is usually the first part of the roller coaster. Once you get there, you go down the hill, but you have enough energy to finish the ride, right? In the case of a chemical reaction, it takes some energy to go from here and to get you up to there. Once you're at the transition state, you have enough energy to finish the ride wherever it is it's going to stop. Um, that amount of energy to get over the hill we refer to as the activation energy or the energy of activation. That's what this EA stands for. So the energy of activation is going to be the difference between the reactants and the transition state. So you, you would say, okay, it takes you know, five kilocalories of energy to go from here to there, and then it's going to go down to whatever your, pro your products are. So delta H is going to be the difference between the products and the reactants, and the energy of activation is going to be the difference between the transition state and the reactants. Activation energy is the minimum amount of energy that the reactants have to have for a reaction to occur. Um, the height of that transition state, right, so the height of this up here, the taller it is, the harder the reaction is going to be to occur, and the slower reaction is going to occur. So the second bullet point says the EA is re can be thought of as an energy barrier, and the height determines the, activate, the rate of the reaction. Um, when the activation energy is really high, few molecules are going to have enough energy to cross that barrier, and it's going to be much slower than if it was lower. And um, if you can imagine yourself out uh, going for a hike or doing something like that, if you were walking around and there's a big old uh, hill in front of you, it takes a bunch of energy to go up the hill and right, it might take you, depending on where you're at, probably not anywhere in Florida, but if you're climbing like a mountain out in you know, the Rockies or something like that, it takes a lot of energy to climb up a big old hill. Um, now, if you compare yourself to Florida and what we might call a hill here, you might go up like three steps and you're at the top of it. It doesn't take a whole lot of energy to get over it, and you're going to be able to move through that pretty quickly. 
So again, the higher that barrier, the, the slower the reaction is going to occur. The lower the barrier, the more the easier it is going to be for the reaction to, to proceed, and it's going to happen a lot faster. Again, if delta H is negative, the products are going to be lower than the reactants. It's going to be exothermic. Delta H is positive. The products are higher than the reactants. Delta H is positive. You have an endothermic reaction. Reaction rates, like the speed of the reaction we talked about in the previous video, um, can be, be determined by the height of the activation energy. Um, so how do we determine how easy it is for things to kind of uh, surpass that activation energy? Well, there's a couple um, things that are necessary. So one, you have to have uh, molecules collide, and they have to collide with enough energy to surpass that activation energy. So how do we make that happen? Well, you can increase the number of collisions that happen if you increase the concentration of the reactants. If you imagine um, you have two... Uh, people walking around blindfolded in a very, very, very large room, um, they're probably not going to run into each other on accident, like without noticing, uh, very easy. If you imagine like that you have a, like a football field, right? Two people blindfolded walking around on a football field. It's unlikely that they're going to hit each other. Now, you put 100 people out there, right? The odds of them running into each other goes up a lot because they're more likely just to walk into each other because you have an increase in the concentration of the reactants. Um, so you're going to increase the number of collisions. The more collisions you have, the faster that rate is going to occur. Now the other thing you can do is increase the temperature. So I can't use people for this one, but if you just imagine molecules, as you heat them up, they're going to move faster. Or I guess I can use people. So pretend that if you were to heat the people up, that they're going to... Um, So imagine if you heat the people up and they, they're going to walk faster. So now if you have the same 100 people on a football field and they're all moving faster, they're going to run into each other even more often, right? You could probably even move it down to 50 people, but if they're moving faster, you're still going to have more reactions. So the, by increasing the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy of the molecules, meaning they're going to move faster, and that's also going to increase the reaction rate.